Hello, everyone. This is Ed Helensky for the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. Welcome. We've got a great special guest here today. Longtime coach from a different era, Coach Ray Corzelius. Coach, good to see you. Thank you so much for Zooming with us today from your home in Williamsville. Good talking to you, Ed. I'm really looking forward to this. You're 88 years old, sharp as a tack. <laughs> you uh, were the molder of young men as uh, the freshman coach at uh, Payne and then at Lowry. Um, I, I don't well, know if was... you did anything at, at uh, Rezzle, but give us a little background about your, your coaching and teaching career at North Tonawanda. Okay, Ed, I started at North Tonawanda in uh, July of 1963 uh, with the summer school program. And um, I was asked to try that. And if I liked it, then commit myself to North Tonawanda. If I didn't like it, go somewhere else. Um, and I, I fell in love with this. I'm a South Buffalo boy. And uh, going to North Tonawanda was like returning home. So in that first year of 63, I was the assistant wrestling coach to uh, Joe Rotunda. And at that same time, I had had a background with football at Bishop Fallon High School and also O'Hara High School in Tonawanda. And I think it was in 1966, um, I started with the freshman football as an assistant coach to Ed Veitch, uh, who later went on to uh, Niagara Community College and was the athletic director over there. But I was one year as an assistant coach to him. He went to Niagara Community, and I became the head coach uh, at Payne Junior High. Wrestle was not completed at that time. So um, that was 1967, and I had really an outstanding team, with, uh, which eventually would be the class of 1971. Meanwhile, I was still coaching wrestling, and I – Coach Wrestling is head coach from 1964 to 1971. Wow. Um, back then, freshman football, you were the molder of young men, high on testosterone and, and whatever else at that point. Um, how difficult was it to be to coaching and, and, and guiding boys that were 13 and 14 years old? Well, to be honest with you, it, it fit in very well because – at that time, in the early 60s and late 50s and so forth, there was still some discipline. Um, kids were willing to listen to you. Uh, there weren't the outside attractions that you had later on, because I did return to coaching wrestling in 1982, I think it was, and it was a completely different, different atmosphere. I did not, did not fit in, I, to be honest with you. I did not get along with the kids. They didn't want to do anything that I requested. But in the early 60s, anything you asked, they would do. And on top of that, you didn't have the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and all the rest of them that kids could go and get a job and leave athletics. Athletics, especially in North Tonawanda, was a big, big part of their life. So uh, as I said, I thought I had returned home to South Buffalo uh, with the North Tonawanda. They were the same attitude, the same financial background that, that I had been raised in. And I, I, everything fit very, very well. You, as freshman coach, North Tonawanda system was, uh, at that point, was dictated by George Vetter. Amen. From the varsity side, JV side, even to the freshman side. Absolutely. Um, what were some of the things that uh, you had to adhere to uh, Georgia's system? Well, it was a very rigid system. Um, he demanded that we use the wing, either single wing or double wing with, with an unbalanced line. And in many ways, that, that was an advantage because the other schools had gone basically to the T formation at that time. And they were unfamiliar with an unbalanced line. So quite often, and of course, the emphasis with the, the wing formation was on running. It was not on passing. So you really did not need a quarterback or a tailback that 
had to pass like you did with the T and some of the other formations. Uh, eventually, in my second or third year at Payne, I began to bring in some other formations, uh, which did not go over very well, but um, what the heck, <laughs> I did it anyways. Who were some of your uh, assistant coaches at Payne Junior High? Uh, the first year was a fellow by the name of Hugh Gantner. Uh, who uh, had a tremendous background. He was actually a Canadian fellow, but he had been born in Lima, Peru. And his father uh, during World War II was a German uh, naval captain. So they came over to, after the war, they came over to St. Catharines, where his mother still ran an import export business. And he went into the army in order to get American citizenship. Now he only stayed at Payne for one year. And uh, then he had some business dealings. He wanted to go back down to South America, uh, and, he, and he left. After that, it was uh, Dick Wilk, who had played football at, at Tanawanda High School and had done very well there. And then um, Jammer, um, huh, I can't even think of Jammer's name now. But um, those were the, the other coaches that I had with me. Now, I only was at Payne from, I'm going to say, um, 66 until probably 1970. Okay. Did you have to give like uh, scouting reports or reports after each game and, and, and funnel that up to coach better? No, not necessarily. But what we did have to do is that we had to scout varsity games for him. Uh, I can remember one night sitting in a Lockport game and it was pouring rain and we had to submit reports on that. Uh, we didn't have film. Everything was done by um, writing it all down and things like that. But we did have scouting. And the other thing that he insisted upon was that, uh, which I loved, was in August when practice was allowed to start, um, he had the whole, all the coaches there, the freshman coaches, the JV coaches, and the varsity coaches. And we all worked with the varsity at that time for, I'm going to say a week or two weeks because freshman football wasn't allowed to start until after school had actually convened. Whereas the varsity, uh, you could start earlier. Back in those August, um, you talked about bringing all the coaches together. Would there be organized meetings by, by Coach Fetter with, with the coaches and, and what his expectations were for the year? Not, not really. There was a little bit, but there, it was more of a camaraderie thing. It was to get all the coaches together. And, and the fellow that I really identified with more than anybody else was probably Nick Seabay. Um, thought the world of him. Why is that? Why did you, what, what, well, do, you, what had, do you remember about Coach Seabay? Well, he was very well organized and he knew exactly what he was doing. And he had the line, he, but for the most part, he coached the line. And he had played at Indiana. Uh, and as a matter of fact, had a tryout and went with the Washington Redskins. He was, he was the backup to the old quarterback, Sammy Baugh, which is probably a name that anybody listening to this won't even remember. But Sammy Baugh was uh, the leading uh, quarterback at, with the Washington Redskins for years and years. Now, this is exactly when the American Football Association was starting. And Nick had told me that years, years later, he told me this, that he was really hoping to go with the Buffalo Bills, but uh, they didn't draft him. He ended up with the Washington Redskins. But he was, he was sharp. He was a very quiet guy, very reserved guy, but he really knew his stuff. There were George Tedder, Chuck Williams, Wally yeah. Greider. What do you remember about those coaches? Well, <clears throat> Tedder was actually the one that brought me to North Tonawanda. He and I were taking graduate classes at Canisius College. And I was teaching at a Catholic school at that time at Bishop Fallon. And um, the pay was so bad. And I had a couple of kids and man, I needed, I needed a salary. And uh, George and I were in an English class together. And he said to me, he said, okay, he said, why don't you um, apply up to NT? And I had known George Fetter's wife. I never knew George, but I knew Nina from years past. And um, so I did. I went out and I, uh, he, George Tedder arranged for an interview for me. I went out, had the interview, and 
and they hired me right away. Now, this was in November of uh, 1962. We talk, when we talked earlier this week, you mentioned something about there was a little bit of friction between the administration and the athletic department in North Tonawanda. Any yeah, sure stories that you can uh, share with us about that? Well, there was a resentment because the basketball coach, who was uh, George Bancroft at that time, and George Vetter and John Pluak and so forth, they all felt that the administration and the superintendent and the two assistant superintendents were anti-athletic. I don't think they really were, but they were more focused on academics rather than athletics. Academics came first. And some of the coaches resented that. On top of that, there was a, at that time, the athletic department had a separate fund. I don't, I don't know where they got the funds from, but it really did not go through the bookkeeping system of the school system. So North Tonawanda, I mean, I could not believe it when I first saw what was happening. I mean, kids would get individual towels each day for their shower. The equipment was top notch, not the freshmen. We were still wearing the leather helmets, you know, one size fits all. But the, the varsity, I mean, the equipment that they had was phenomenal. Uh, eventually, the state kind of stepped in and said, hey, wait a minute. This all has to be under one budget, never mind separate budgets. So there was kind of a resentment about that too, because their, their funds were taken away from them and they weren't allowed to spend what they wanted without. I forgot them. about two coaches or, and assistants as well too, John Pluak and, yep. and Verdon Kurzweil. What do you recall about those gentlemen? Well, Pluak, Pluak was a wheeler and dealer. I mean, he, uh, he was in charge of all the equipment and he made sure, I mean, he coached too, but basically he was the equipment manager and he made sure that we had, especially the football team had top notch stuff all the time. And he was a jokester. I mean, he was, uh, he was the guy that brought some levity to the meetings when they would get too serious and so forth. And he was very well liked, very well liked. Uh, Tedder, uh, was in and out. I mean, um, George was not as uh, social as, as the other coaches were. George and, and Nick Seebeck was like that too. Uh, we, we, we would have functions. We would go up to Canada in August after practices. And Pluek had a cabin up there, a cottage up there. And I think so did better. And, you know, we'd have parties and things like that. But Seebeck and Tedder never would go. They... Uh, they just didn't wouldn't fit in. I don't know why. Talk about Burden Kurzweil. I mean, a lot of people during the 70s and the 80s knew him as the chorus teacher, but yep. he had quite the football career as well, too. Yes, he did. He had played at LaSalle High School in the falls. And I believe the position he played was center. And apparently he, he was very good because he ended up going to Bucknell for on a football scholarship for a year. But uh, he didn't like it too much. Uh, his background and his family, mother and father, uh, their background was in music. So he transferred uh, then to Fredonia uh, and finished up his, for his bachelor's and everything at Fredonia. But uh, he used to volunteer. He, he was not an assigned coach or anything like that. But I had him come with me with the freshman team to help with the centers because I I didn't know anything about that position or anything else. And he would, he'd come down, he'd volunteer. I mean, that was the, the other acceptable thing with North Tonawanda. You had people who would bend over backwards to help you out. I mean, it, I can't tell you how, how welcoming an atmosphere it was to go to North Tonawanda. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I really did. You so, also, when you became varsity uh, wrestling coach, you had several of the boys who were on the football team that, that transitioned to wrestling with you in the wintertime. That's um, correct. It was a great way to keep them in shape year round, basically, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, that was another part of the disagreement between Better and myself. Okay. I, I was of the belief 
that what, especially with the wing, what you wanted were linemen that could run and do downfield blocking, pull and run. That was, that was my whole mantra. Vetter, no. Vetter wanted big men who were solid and stayed on that line and did not move. And I, for years, I tried to talk him into, look, George, talk to some of these kids that are in other sports or are not in sports to come out for wrestling. But he, he would never do it. He would never do it. He just, no. So, you know, that was it's a, part of the disagreement. George and I were not, I'm going to say we're not the best of friends. Well, that's okay. I mean, but uh, obviously he listened to you and at least uh, what you had to say, whether he agreed or not. Yeah, but that's true. That's true. Niagara Frontier League, 1970s, wrestling, ferocious, to say the least. A lot of good teams. Uh, Tonawanda, Kenmore East, Niagara Wheatfield, Kenmore West. Absolutely. <sighs> Niagara Wheatfield was uh, the leader. They, uh, they went undefeated for a number of years. I mean, we came close. Uh, in 63, actually, uh, we beat Niagara Wheatfield. But that was the last time. Uh, after that, they went, I don't know how many years, uh, with Armin Cacciatore, who eventually also became the head football coach at Wheatfield. And I'll tell you, uh, Tano, North Tonawanda, had a terrible time with, with football, with uh, Niagara Wheatfield in those, those years. And also the other thing that was happening is in 70, I'm going to say 72 or so, uh, Louport became a big football program and a big wrestling program too. But uh, yes, you're right. In the early seven, late sixties, early seventies, the Niagara Frontier League in football and wrestling was probably the top in Western New York. Coach, what other assistant coaches were there in the North Tonawanda football system back in the 1960s? Well, later on in the, in the middle 60s, uh, when um, I'm not sure what year Rezl actually opened, but um, you had George Dermazich, uh, who had actually been coaching at, uh, in fact, I've coached with him at um, Bishop Turner High School or Bishop O'Hara high school. And then uh, later on, you had Dave Anastasi, and you had uh, Fran Burke. Um, let's see. He also had Al Maglisco, too. Yeah, and Al, Al Maglisco was with the varsity. Now, Anastasi and Burke ended up coaching at, uh, at Rezl. Okay. Uh, Dermazich actually also coached at Rezl after he left um, Cardinal O'Hara High School. Then he came to North San Juan as a phys ed teacher. And Maglisco? Maglisco, uh, he had kind of retired probably around 64 or so. Uh, I'm not sure if he retired completely from teaching or just kind of left the, the football program. But by the time he got into uh, 66, 67, 68, new coach, uh, younger coaches were coming in. And I'm not sure, I think do you know how long Vetter was there? I don't know when he. Vetter finished, uh, 1970 was his last season, I believe. Okay, okay. How, now, how there's, we, you know, there's an interesting thing there too. Um, everybody, everybody, a number of people uh, were hoping that Nick Seebeck would become the head coach. But Nick was a very proud individual and he would not apply for it. So what happened was um, Ramsey, who had been coaching at uh, Bishop Gibbons, did apply for it. <laughs> and Ramsey got the coaching job with, uh, with the varsity. And uh, Nick, if Nick had gotten head coach, George Tedder and I were going to be his assistant coaches. So we were all out <laughs> after that. But, you know, politics, so. Politics and history. How, yeah. would you, how would you describe the Niagara Frontier League in the 1960s and the 1970s? Tremendous athletes, tremendous athletes. And I, I go back to what I, I said in our first half was that I think a lot of it was because of attitude of the kids. 
the kids, you know, they were from blue collar, hard working families, the Polish and the German families, especially in, in North Tatawanda. They knew what it was like to be, I'm going to say tough. They knew what it was like. Uh, nothing was handed to them, nothing at all. And I think that carried over to the athletics, especially the athletics where uh, you had combat. And I'm going to include wrestling and in, in football in those two categories. I don't think you found that same attitude in, with the Kenmore schools or maybe Lockport, uh, but Lockport didn't have the coaching staff. And you eventually saw it with, uh, with Wheatfield too, that same attitude of tough kids with nothing handed to them and we got to scrap for everything we get. And that was carried over. Now we never, I don't remember ever scrimmaging any of the Buffalo public schools. Um, we had scrimmages with St. Joe's and those were always, let me tell you, that was combat. That was combat right from the very first whistle. But there was a relationship there, too. Uh, the fellow that was coaching um, St. Joe's and went four years on to feed of us, the fellow by the name of Bill Fitzhenry. And Bill and his assistant coach was Bob Schwegler, who was a North Tonawanda fellow. They went four years undefeated at St. Joe's. So they were the top in the what they called the Burke League in the Catholic division. There were two, two leagues. There was the Burke League, and I can't remember what the other one was, but the other league was with the ones, the smaller schools like Gibbons and so forth. The Burke League was Canisius and Timon and St. Joe's, and those were combat teams too. I mean, and, and NT would scrimmage them, and it was always, uh, was always a battle. So I think more than anything that really determined – how good these athletes, how good these kids was their backgrounds, their home backgrounds. Question for you. Was there any reason why NT never uh, scrimmage Gibbons? I don't know. I, I have no idea what was behind that. I, I don't know. You would think that Gibbons being uh, literally right down the street from them, um, it, would be a, it would be a natural thing, but unfortunately it, it never happened. I was just wondering if there was any backstory with that. Well, it could be, again, and you know, I, I'm sticking my neck out here a little bit. When I came to North Taiwan in 63, I had a summer school class. <laughs> I had senior English kids that had failed the regents and, and were back to see if they could pass it after summer school. My first week in the school, uh, in the class, a fight broke out between a an Italian girl and a Polish girl. <laughs> and there was that there was that animosity. And there was there was also a certain degree of animosity between the Lutherans and the Catholics in North Tonawanda. I mean, it was a it was a fine line. Uh, I can remember that um, I'm gonna say 64, 65, some there was a um, a dinner put on by uh, actually at the American Legion post and uh, Dr. Fryatt, who was the superintendent. And I can't think of the priest that was the principal at Gibbons, a fantastic guy, but that was the first time they had ever been in a public gathering together. There was, there were some hard feelings there. And I know when the, when Gibbons closed and those students came to NT, uh, they were fearful. They were really fearful of what might happen uh, with prejudice and so forth, but I never saw any of it. I mean, they fit in very, very well after six months or so, no problem at all. So whether that was what was behind, I mean, the rivalry between Gibbons and NT, maybe they were afraid that, okay, we have the football game, but what's going to happen after the football game when the kids are back out on the streets? I don't know. That could have been it. I don't know. I honestly don't know. You were an English teacher for 32 years at the North Tonawanda system. Um, wrestling coach. If you look at this, you, you didn't look like the classic English teacher at that point. Um, you had a, a, several of your players as well, too, I'm sure, during classes as well, too. Here's one question I want to ask you. 
Uh, you don't have to be specific about it, but were there times or did you hear of things where um, coaches may have approached some teachers and say, look, I need to have this guy passed and his grade needs to be bumped up. Did those th type of things occur that you heard of uh, during the days in the 60s and 70s? I heard them of occurring very, very seldom. I, I'm going to say in, in the whole 32 years that I was there, I probably was aware of maybe three cases that whole time. Um, again, you and I had spoken earlier uh, yesterday about a situation. I was not there at the time. I got this all secondhand. So, um, but there was, <laughs> there was some friction in that in the 19, I'm going to say 1963, uh, and between the NT and Tonawanda football game. The story was, and again, I was not there, but I heard this. The story was that some fellows from the NT football team, and I won't mention any names, but you can look at the roster at that time, went over to the Tonawanda High School and did some damage to the parking lot. And they got caught. And there was a big question as to whether they would be allowed to play in the Tonawanda North Tonawanda game, which was the next night or something like that. And I, I think eventually they were allowed, but a lot of people, especially from Tonawanda, were very upset uh, that these kids were let off. So there was, there was that, but again, I was not privy to that. I was not an insider on that. Those were just stories that I heard. Uh, later on, if you want, after you cut off, I can give you some names that you may want to check with because they were part of the program. Well, I have a pretty good idea who those might yeah. be. And, and yeah. it's probably best that they remain nameless at yeah. this point. <laughs> okay. And that's fine. Um, you retired right around 1995. Do you, do you miss coaching? Do you miss teaching? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Very much so. I, um, Still do, even after 26 years. Yeah, I still do. And especially at certain times of the year, you know, uh, September, November. Um, and I, where I live right now, I have a townhouse right behind me is a uh, elementary school. And when I hear those kids out playing in the, uh, the play field and so forth, man, uh, yeah, I, I do. I miss it very, very much. But let me, let me qualify this a little bit, too. I took the wrestling back again in the 80s uh, at the urging of people. They wanted me to get into it again. It was a different attitude, Ed. I, uh, I did not fit in. I, I, you would ask kids to do – kids would lie to me, which I never had happened to me before. Um, they'd miss weight and tell me that they had weighed in in the morning and they had made weight. I'd get to – a match and they were so overweight, it was ridiculous. And, you know, if they told me the truth and drugs, drugs were becoming pretty prominent uh, in the seventies. You know, I, I after 72, um, things began to go downhill for teaching. They really did. I, I was ready to quit at that time to get out because it was a different attitude. It was not the attitude that I liked or that I was familiar with. How would you describe your coaching style, whether it was football or wrestling? I think I was pretty strict. I, um, I demanded, uh, especially with the wrestling, um, I demanded that um, to qualify for a letter sweater, uh, they had to achieve certain certain number of wins. If they didn't get it, they did not get a letter sweater. That was that was another kind of a thing between Vetter and myself too. It was, seemed to me that he gave letter sweaters to everybody, and I I was against that. That was not the way I was taught. That's not the way I played when I was in high school either. So, so I, I think I was fairly strict, but I I think I was fair. Um, and I to back that up. I still hear from a good many of those kids even after retiring 26 years, I still hear from them. And um, they're all pretty complimentary, <laughs> I don't know whether, whether they're lying now or not. But uh, I mean, I, I'm in contact with people like 
uh, Dan Fire and, and Pat Campbell and, and people like Jeff Small and and uh, a couple of Jim Wants and things like that, people like that. You're 88 years old. You're active on social media. What else keeps you busy and active? Uh, well, this past year, I, I've had some medical problems. So I, um, you know, they keep telling me I'm not 16 anymore. So I, which I'm not really willing to accept. But uh, so this past year with the COVID and everything else slowing down. But prior to that, uh, I did some traveling. Uh, I've been to Ireland five times. Um, but, and I have a son that lives in North Carolina, so I've been down to see him and things like that. So I do a lot of reading. I have, library is only two blocks away, and I'm probably their favorite customer up there. And by the way, I have uh, nine grand, uh, eight grandchildren and nine great grandchildren. Wow. My oldest, my oldest grand, great grandchild will be 16 this month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How would you like to be remembered as a coach and as a teacher? Somebody that was fair and would listen to, would listen to kids. That's, you know, and, and that um, not overly demanding, but was considered uh, somebody that knew their subject and both coaching and, and uh, with the academics and, uh, was a fair person to their students. Do you have any regrets as a coach or as an as a educator? No, not really. Uh, as I said, uh, when I first went to, um, I, I didn't start out as a teacher. My bachelor's degree is in English. I never thought, it, I used to look down on teachers and I kind of fell into it um, as a let's try it situation. And what happened was, was that I, I actually, I was a sales manager for a company with that, but most of that work was in the evening. <clears throat> and the school that I was at needed a German teacher and German was my, uh, was my um, extra subject with it. English, was my minor subject with English. So <clears throat> I filled in. Well, the next thing that I know, I was there all the time. And I, uh, Jim Hogan was a football coach. So I used to go over and help him out uh, in Delaware Park with the football team. And finally, but the company that I was working for called me in. They said, look, your sales are going, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> so I, I went home and I said to my wife, you know what? I got to make a decision. And uh, she said, well, what do you think you like? I said, I love this. Love this being with the kids. I mean, I thought I was 16 again. I was running around with playing basketball, playing football with the kids. Um, so I went to, I gave up the sales job and I became a teacher. Uh, let me tell you, the, the salary at that year, this is 1961, was $3,000 a year. I wow. had two, two kids and I was married and I had a mortgage. So... <laughs> So that's how I ended up with Tedder and ending up going to North Tanawanda, where the salary was considerably more than it was in the, uh, with the Catholic schools. But it was the best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. I loved it. I loved teaching. I didn't like the administration too much. And then I must admit, when I finally retired, uh, I was not a happy camper all the way. But, um, and part of it was because I thought that there wasn't any discipline anymore. As an educator and as a coach, would you do anything differently if you could go back? Well, yeah, I think I would. I, I think I would concentrate more on it. I mean, and maybe I'm making excuses here. I don't know. When I, when I started, um, the husbands were the breadwinners, okay? Wives did not work. They were home raising the kids. And, it, and that was part of the the system was blue collar workers. I mean, that's the way it was. And I had, well, by the time I went to NT, I had three kids. So <clears throat> I was working other jobs. I mean, uh, for most of my career, while I was teaching and coach, I worked three jobs. In fact, from November until April, I never saw daylight. I mean, I was either at work and I'd leave early in the morning, it was still dark. 
by the time I got home at 11 o'clock or so at night, it was still dark. So I was, I was teaching at NT, I was coaching at NT, and I was teaching nights at Niagara Community. So I had, I had three jobs for, for quite a while. If I had it to do over, I would disregard the night jobs and things like that and concentrate more on, the, on my day jobs, let's put it that way, coaching in the classroom. If you met somebody off the street, having a conversation with somebody and he started talking about um, your coaching career at North Tonawanda or, or, or the North Tonawanda system back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, what would you tell that person? That it was the best. Academically, uh, athletically, it was, it was fantastic. I, I really, as I said, when I went there in 1963, I thought I had died and go out to heaven. I mean, it was, it was all brand new. You got a high school had just opened the new high school from rather than Payne Um, had opened. I think uh, the first graduating class was in 63, June of 63. So I came in July of 63. So that was all brand new. We had, and because it was brand new, they had a hire of a good many brand new teachers. So there, there was a spirit about it that I don't think you could find anywhere else. I, I just never saw it. I mean, we were all broke. Uh, we all were all young. We were all, I mean, Kennedy had been president up until November of 63. There was kind of a spirit going on. And in my mind, that all started to change in 71, 72 with Vietnam and all the rest of it. And uh, uh-uh. then it, change. But when I first went there, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. We've talked about some different topics and subjects, and I thank you so much for it. What haven't I asked you that you'd like to talk about? Well, nothing really. I mean, I love this going down memory lane, (laughs) and I just hope I have all my facts correct. Uh, But let me just say that it was a good time, Ed. It was really a good time. And and those people that lived through those early 60s, right into the probably the middle 70s, uh, I think if you talk to any one of them, um, they would say that it was the best years of their lives. I mean, we always hear that the high school is the best years of your life. Well, you probably don't realize that until you're 60 years of age. But, but I, it, I think most of them would say that. And, and many of them have done very, very well for themselves. I mean, that's what I mean. Academically... We did well out of North Tonawanda. I mean, it was not a it was not a patsy school. Um, Jeff Smalden, for instance, is a forensic pathologist. I mean, uh, with his doctor, there's a number of people that really, from those early '60s or middle and late '60s, have done very, very well for themselves. Coach Corzelius, this was a pleasure to have you on uh, today. Um, this is pure gold. I got to thank you so much. And I'm sure some of our viewers are going to be making wonderful comments about this, this video as well, too. I wish you well. I wish you good health. And uh, you're probably going to outlast many of us. So, Coach Ray <laughs> Corzelius, thank you so much for being our guest today on the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. Thank you, Ed, for having me. I really, I really appreciate this walking down memory lane once again. Unfortunately, I can still remember a lot of those things. (laughs) Thanks again, Ed.